Thank you guys so much for having me. This is such an enormous treat for me. It is such a huge, huge honor to be part of the Vital Smarts family, to come in to get some, to spend some time with you today. Thank you so much, particularly everyone waking up so early. I live in California, so it's really early by my internal clock. And, um, and I was hoping, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending the next couple of days with all of you, and I hope I get a chance to talk to everyone one-on-one. -on -one. But I thought what I would spend a little bit of time talking about this morning is to introduce you a little bit to the power of habit, those of you who, who aren't familiar with it. And I started becoming interested in habits about nine years ago now. I was a reporter at the New York Times, um, and I had been sent to Iraq to be a war correspondent. And when I got to Iraq, I met this army major who seemed to be doing this fantastic job of kind of making everything work. And I went over to this guy, and I asked him, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, everything is hard, you, you got all these 18-year-olds and you, they all wake up and they do exactly what, hey, tell me what to do, right? My wife and I were talking about have, having kids and I was like, please tell me what to do to keep, to keep a bunch of people listening to you. And he said, well, look, you know, when you join the army, one of the things that you learn is that the army is this giant habit change machine, right? They teach you how to recognize habits. They teach you how to change your habits, how to change the habits of your troops, how to think in terms of habits. And he said, this line that I'll never forget, he said, when you learn to see the world in terms of habits, it's like people have given you these rose-colored glasses. And when you put them on, everything that seemed complicated before suddenly all makes sense. And so I thought this was fascinating. And I decided I want to learn more about what we know about habits. And I found out that we're living through this golden age of understanding the neurology of habit formation. And so I went, I came back to the U.S. and I wanted to learn a lot about it. And the first thing I learned is that if you want to learn about habits, you have to really like to learn about rats. Now, does anyone in this room, does anyone here experiment with rats on a regular basis? No, no, no hands. One hand went up. Okay. We'll find out later what exactly is going on at home. Um, how many of you uh, go to New York and ride the subway on a regular basis? Okay, so you know rats, right? You've got plenty of familiarity with rats. <laughs> There's a woman named Dr. Ann Grabiel, who's a researcher at MIT, who spent her entire career trying to figure out how to observe rats' neurological activity as they go about their daily, their daily business. And eventually she figured this out. And what she would do is that she would take a rat and she'd put sensors inside of its cranium and then she would drop it in the world's simplest maze because she wanted to see how the rat thought as it was running through this maze. And what's interesting about this maze is that this maze works exactly the same way every single time. There's a click, this partition moves, and then the rat's free to run up and down the maze and look for the chocolate. Now, the first time you drop a rat in a maze like this, it will take that animal up to 20 minutes to find the chocolate. And so for years, most people thought that rats must be the laziest animals on the face of the planet to take 20 years. But Dr. Grabiel, when she dropped her first rat in this maze and could see what was going on inside its head, she found something kind of incredible. What she found is that the rat in the maze was thinking hard the entire time. This is a simplified neurological graph of the first time that a rat is dropped in a maze like this. And all those spikes in brain activity, that's the rat trying to make sense of what's going on. So you drop a rat in a maze, there's a click, the partition moves, and the rat starts scratching the walls, and the motor vehicle parts of its brain light up with activity. It starts sniffing the air, and its olfactory senses start to, start to, start to show a huge amount of neurological activity. It finally finds the chocolate, and there's this reward sensation that overtakes its entire brain. What's interesting is that even though it takes a rat 20 minutes to find that chocolate, the rat is thinking as hard as it can the entire time. And a lot of what we know about how learning happens came from this experiment. Because it turns out this is the same thing that infants do. It's known as unmediated or unhypothesized learning. That when you don't know what to make sense of, you try and absorb everything. And that was pretty interesting. This was a big breakthrough in our understanding of how any animal learns about its world. But Dr. Grabiel wasn't done. What she did with every single rat is she would drop it in the maze again and again and again, 150 times per animal. And unsurprisingly, the rats would get faster and faster and faster finding the chocolate, right? There would be a click, the partition would move, the rat would start making a beeline to the chocolate. In fact, the rat would start doing it so quickly that it started to look like a habit. What was really interesting, though, is that as the rat got faster and faster and faster at finding the chocolate, it started thinking less and less and less. This, this is an, a, a simplified graph 
of the neurological activity in the 150th iteration through that maze. And that deep valley that you see in brain activity, that's the same thing that you would see if the rat was going to sleep. Now there's a woman named Dr. Wendy Wood who's a researcher today at USC, she was at Duke, who followed around hundreds of people for an entire year trying to figure out how much of our daily activities are habits and how much are decisions. And what she found out is that about 40 to 45% of what all of us do every day is not a choice, it's a habit. When you're backing your car out of the driveway and you're, you're kind of on autopilot, when you, when you remember leaving home and now you're at your desk and you are certain that you did drive from home to your desk, but you can't really remember how, that's because a habit took over. When you told, tell your spouse in the morning, I'm gonna go have a salad for lunch today because I'm trying to lose a couple pounds, and then you walk into the cafeteria and get the same hamburger that you get every single day without thinking about it or pretending you're not thinking about it, that, that's because your brain is actually turned off. When we are in the grip of a habit, we actually stop thinking. In fact, this is an amazing part of evolution. Every single animal has a neurological structure known as the basal ganglia that exists simply to make habits. Because without them, we would have to think about everything all the time. We'd be exhausted. But there's this interesting exception to this turning off and shutting down rule, which is at the beginning of a maze, when a rat hears that click, that means that the partition's about to open, there's this burst of neurological activity right there. And then brain activity tapers down as it scurries through the maze. And then it finds the chocolate at the end. And it's as if the rat's brain shakes itself awake again, starts paying attention to what's going on, very close attention. Now, as Dr. Graybeal found this, this neurological signature of a habit, and she published it, it transformed everything about how we think about automatic behaviors. Because what it told us is what's known today as the habit loop. What the habit loop says in both neuro, neuro, excuse me, neurology and psychology is that a habit isn't actually one thing. It's three things. There's a cue, which is like a trigger for an automatic behavior to start. And then there's the routine, the behavior itself, what we think of as a habit. And then finally, a reward. And that reward is why your brain takes that pattern and makes it automatic. There is a reward, even if you're not aware of it, when you back your car out of the driveway. There's a reward, maybe it doesn't feel like it, when you drive from your home to your office and get to your desk. Somehow your brain is celebrating that you just completed a chunk of behavior that it expected. And what's important about this is that for years, everyone from Aristotle to Oprah has talked about changing habits, right? And most of the time they focus on the routine, they focus on the behavior. But what we now know is that if you can diagnose those cues and those rewards, if you can figure out what in your environment is causing the habit, then you have these new tools to fiddle with the gears and to change how you and your coworkers and your kids and your spouse, most importantly your spouse, how they automatically, unthinkingly behave. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, is what do we know about that? One of my favorite examples of this is exercise. How many folks in this room exercise on a regular basis? The healthy, healthy, how many of you wish that you exercise on a little bit more of a regular basis? Okay, me too. So there was this, um, this German healthcare plan that in a couple of years ago brought about a thousand of its members into a room, just like this. And they, they, they gave them this lecture about why you, they, why you should exercise more. They said, you should all exercise more, because <laughs> apparently everyone in Germany sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, <laughs> so, so they give this lecture. Guess who isn't German? They give this lecture to the whole crowd. It's about a half hour lecture. The exercise is really important. And then they take a third of the room, like everyone over here, and they take them off to a side room, and they give them an extra 10 minute lecture. And in this 10 minute lecture, they say two things. They say, number one, we want you to choose a cue for exercise. Like put your running shoes next to your bed so you see them when you wake up in the morning or, or plan on meeting your friend every, every Wednesday at the gym. And then when you're done exercising, we want you to give yourself a small piece of chocolate right away as soon as you're done exercising. Now this is counterintuitive because most of us, we go to the gym and then we wait like 45 minutes before we eat chocolate to pretend like they're not related to each other. <laughs> but, but the Germans, the Germans were like, give yourself the chocolate right away because we think it's gonna make it easier. Once you have a reward there, once a cue and reward, it'll be easier to exercise. So nine months later, they tracked down everyone in the room. Everyone on this side of the room, about 18% of people are exercising, which you see with any large population. This side of the room, 29% of people are exercising. 
And when they asked them why they were exercising, they said things like, you know, I love chocolate. It's so good. (laughs) But most importantly, what they learned is that if you teach people about the habit loop, if you teach them to recognize the cues and the rewards and start giving themselves cues and rewards, that it makes it easier for them to change their habits. And what we know is that some habits matter more than others. Some habits, when they start to change, they set off this chain reaction in our lives. Within the academic literature, these are referred to as keystone habits. And I wanted to talk a little bit about keystone habits because one of the big questions, particularly for folks who are working with companies, for people who work in companies, for folks like ourselves who care about what our lives are like in companies, is how do keystone habits emerge within organizations? How do we identify the habits that our workplaces can teach us and that exist in our workplaces to make us into better, healthier people? And to tell you a little bit about that, I wanna tell you a story. And it's the story of the King's Cross subway station. Now, I don't know, has anyone here ever been to the King's Cross subway station in London? Okay, a number of you have. So if you had been there before 1985, you know that the King's Cross subway station was this amazing place. It was the first and largest subway station in all of the United Kingdom. It actually had the first escalators that had ever been built in the UK. The the subway station actually went five stories down into the ground and it had these wooden escalators, some of which would go for literally three stories down. They were amazing. And on this October evening in 1985, a passenger comes off of the Piccadilly line um, subway station, the subway train, and, he, and at 7.14 in the evening, he starts walking up to the ticketing hall. Now, the ticketing hall is huge. It's, it's like uh, four or five times the size of this room. And, and this passenger, he walks over to this ticket taker, a guy named Philip Raquel, and he says to Philip Raquel, hey, listen, I was just on the subway on the escalator, and it smelled, I, I saw at the bottom of it that there was this burning tissue which that doesn't seem good. You should maybe go take care of that. And Philip Raquel says, okay, I'm a ticket taker, but that sounds worrisome. He takes the escalator down. He finds a burning piece of tissue. He goes over to the rubbish can. He takes a magazine out. He beats out the burning tissue. And then he goes back to his ticketing stand to take more tickets. What he doesn't do is he doesn't investigate why there's a burning tissue. He doesn't, he doesn't ask any questions about it. And even if he had, he wouldn't have known who to call. Because the thing about the, the UK subway system, the tube, is that it is huge. It, tra- it tra- uh, transports 3, 000, 3 million passengers a day and has 19,000 employees. And it's so complicated that they have an organizational chart that looks like this. There's these three guys who are called the barons and they each run their own little fiefdom. And they have lieutenants and sub-lieutenants. Philip Raquel actually worked for this guy right here. And if you were to r- ride that subway station across, the, across London, you would move from fiefdom to fiefdom, right? From responsibility to responsibility without any clue of what was going on. But everyone who worked there, they would have known because there were a series of unwritten rules about the London tube. It was so complicated and so big that they basically said, look, we have to have these organizational habits, ways of getting things done. And the number one habit was don't do someone else's job. Do your own job. If it's your job to take tickets, take tickets. Don't become a firefighter. If it's your job to drive a train, drive a train. Don't try and become a tour guide. Do your own job. Now, it was never written down anywhere, right? But it's just the culture of the organization. It's the habits that have emerged. But differently, the underground had silos. And these silos were its organizational habits. So, back to that night in 1985. A couple minutes later, Another passenger comes off the Piccadilly line escalator into the ticketing hall. It's now 7.29 p.m. and he walks over to a cop. He says to the cop, listen, I was just on that escalator and I smelled a little bit of smoke, so you might wanna look into that. And the cop says, anytime you hear about smoke in a subway station, that's a worrisome thing. So he goes to the exit where his radio works and at 7.36 p.m. he radios his dispatch and he says, please let the fire dispatch know they might want to send some folks to the subway station. He does not radio the fire dispatch himself. What's weird is that there's actually a fire station half a block away from where he is. He could have walked over there, but there's another unwritten rule for the London Underground, which is stay in your lane. Don't freelance. If you're a cop, call cop dispatch. Don't call fire dispatch. 
A couple minutes after that, a train arrives on this, the Victoria Line, and a guy named Derek Silver steps off at 7.40 p.m., and as soon as he steps off the train onto the platform, he knows that there's a problem. He can smell smoke in the air, and he sees people milling around, kind of looking panicked. You've been in situations like this, where people don't know what's wrong, but they know something's wrong. And he says to himself, this is terrible. I'm not getting off here. So he turns to get back onto the train that he had just stepped off of. But the doors have already closed. So he bangs on the doors. And the, the conductor can he- hear him bang. He, Phillips, he sees the conductor. But there's another unwritten rule that's true for every subway system around the world, which is when you close those doors, you do not reopen them if you don't have to. And so the train pulls out of the station. And Silver, standing there on this platform, He starts to get worried. He says, okay, look, I need to climb the escalator up to the ticketing hall. And so that's what he does with everyone else. They start filing up. And when they get into the ticketing hall, he sees something. He sees this phalanx of firemen who have finally been alerted by the call that went from police dispatch to fire dispatch and told to go to the subway station. He sees this phalanx of of firemen entering through one of the doors. But there's hundreds of people in the ticketing hall. And they smell the the faint smoke. And then they look over and they see these firemen rushing in and they all panic. And so they make a beeline for the exits and the firemen can't make it in because all these people are pushing against them, trying to all escape at once. And at this moment, over 40 minutes have passed since the ticket taker saw that burning tissue, but no one has ever called dispatch and said, hey, there might be a problem here because it was no one's job. And so tragedy occurs. Because all the trains are still running, three trains come immediately into the station all simultaneously, on the Victoria Line, the Piccadilly Line, and the Northern Line. And as they do, they push in oxygen into the station in front of them. And this gust of oxygen coming into the station all at the same time acts like the bellows on this small fire that had been building underneath the Piccadilly Line escalator. And as that oxygen hits that small fire, it causes it to grow much larger, much more quickly. Most importantly, it drives up the temperature to what's known as the flashover point. And the flashover point, for those of you who have never heard of it before, and I never had, is when a fire gets so hot so fast that everything in the immediate combustible area explodes into flame. And that's what happened. It was a small fire. It really didn't matter. But as soon as it reaches that flashover point, it ignites everything around it because there's so much oxygen. And because it's in this tunnel that's shaped upwards like this, containing the escalator, when that flashover occurs, it's like the blast from a shotgun shell at the base of a rifle. And it starts pushing all this fire up, up, up the tunnel until it explodes into the ticketing hall. In the immediate vicinity, the 30 feet that are around the entrance to the escalator, the temperature goes up 112 degrees in half a second. In the next nine minutes, 31 people were killed. Now, the the most terrible part of this tragedy, of this fire that took nine hours for them to finally extinguish, is that 49 minutes passed from hearing about that burning tissue to when those people died. 49 minutes when anyone could have called dispatch and said shut off the trains, when they could have cleared out the subway station, when they could have turned on the sprinkler system that the station had but hadn't been activated. And afterwards, Parliament launched an investigation to find out why hadn't anyone done that? How could so many people make so many mistakes? What is wrong with this organization? And so they started investigating every single cause, and they went to the ticket taker, and they asked him, why didn't you notify anyone? And he said, well, you know, a couple years earlier, there had been an influx of American tourists. And American tourists, it turns out, when they come to London, they have a lot of trouble reading the signs. (laughs) And they would say, why is there a circus in Piccadilly? I don't understand. And so the ticket takers... (laughs) The ticket takers became tour guides. They were helpful. They would, they would help them navigate to the train they were supposed to be in. But as a result, the lines got long in front of the ticketing stands, and normal passengers said, don't do that. Do your job. Just sell tickets. Don't try and get outside of your lane. 
There was a really good reason not to become a firefighter if you're a ticket taker. Or the cop who called his own dispatch rather than the fire dispatch. Turns out a couple of years earlier, there had been another fire at another station and there had been cross chatter between the police and the firemen and they felt like it had confused things. And so the word went forth and an unofficial habit, call your own dispatch, don't call someone else's dispatch. Or when Silver got off onto the platform and wanted to get back onto the train and the conductor wouldn't open up the doors again. That is true in every subway system across the world. It is a habit that conductors learn from the day that they begin training because almost every single time a subway stops, someone gets off at the wrong stop. If they opened up the doors every single time someone knocked on them, every train would be late. And so there's a good reason not to open up those doors. Put differently, every single bad habit that existed that contributed to this, to this tragedy They all existed for a good reason, right? And this is true of every organization. There are researchers who spend all of their time documenting the different habits that occur within companies and trying to figure out why do stupid habits exist? And the answer inevitably is because it rewards someone. Right? I'm sure if you think about your own organization, if you think about Vital Smarts, if you think about anything, we all have bad habits. And sometimes our instinct is to say, ah, why is that person so dumb? Why don't they just see the light? Why don't they just do it this way? And the answer is because someone is like, I love that bad habit. Keep it coming because they get some reward from it. And sometimes we do as well. And until we diagnose what that reward is that the bad habit delivers, it'll stay there. No matter how much we try and stamp it out, it will be a part of our life. And so diagnosis of these cues and rewards is always the first step to trying to understand how a habit emerges and why it sticks around. Which raises this kind of other interesting question, what happens across society when this occurs? I wrote a piece recently for the, um, the Atlantic Monthly about why we're so angry, right? What is going on right now that's made Americans so furious at each other that predates our current president, right? It's a tough time right now. Whether you, whether you love who's in the White House or you don't love who's in the White House, I think all of us can agree it's just a hard time. People seem less tolerant right now. And part of it certainly is social media and part of it is the tenor of the times. But a huge part of it too is the rewards that we get for being angry now. So we've looked at anger over centuries and particularly over the last hundred years. Most of the time, think back to the last time you got angry at someone. My guess is, even though it was unpleasant, it made things better. When we're angry and we express our anger, the person we're talking to, they listen really closely to us, right? My wife listens really closely when I shout and I listen really, really closely when she shouts back at me. And we tend to become more malleable. We all have habits built around anger. Anger exists because it's useful to humans. But now think about what's happened in the last five years. Now if you're angry online, it doesn't mean that people are gonna listen closely to you, but it sure does feel good. People might applaud you. Then the crazier thing you say, the more likes you might get. All around us, these rules, these patterns of cues and rewards, they explain how and why we behave. And the more we begin to see them through those rose-colored glasses, the more we begin to see the world as a series of habits, the more control we have over ourselves and to help people live the lives they wanna live. Which brings me to another question, which is when you think about what bad habits exist in your organization, what rewards do they provide? When you think about the last thing you did something that you wish you hadn't done, what reward did you get from it? (coughs) Identifying that will help you figure out how we avoid it next time. And most importantly, it'll help us build better companies. So when I was working on on The Power of Habit and then the next book, Smarter, Faster, Better, Google reached out to me and they invited me to come spend some time with them because they had launched this big project. They wanted to understand how to build the perfect team and they felt that habits might be part of the answer. So I went and I met with them and they had already been working on this for like a year and a half. And what they had done is they have teams all over Google They had gone and they had studied all of the teams and they had tried to figure out what explained why some teams succeeded and why some teams failed. And they had collected literally millions of pieces of data. And their first hypothesis was the best teams are the teams 
where you have the right cast of characters, right? So, so for some teams, you need introverts and extroverts together. And for other teams, you might just need introverts or just need extroverts. Or maybe the best teams are the ones where everyone's friends away from the conference room. And so that that way, when they all get together, they all know each other, there's no tensions. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you want people who are strangers. So there's none of that interpersonal drama that might emerge. They look at it all. They spend a year and a half and $7 million tracking all of their teams. And then they look at their data and they discover they don't know anything. <laughs> Literally, there was no patterns. Google is a company that like specializes in patterns. They had so much data, they could not find any patterns to explain why some teams were doing well and others weren't. And so then they change their strategy altogether and they say, okay, we're gonna stop looking at who's on teams and now we're gonna start looking at how teams behave. We're gonna look at the habits of different teams and see if that explains anything. And that's when they called me. And what, this is, and what they found was that the habits mattered much, much more than anything else. That it did not matter who was on that team, but rather it mattered how that team treated each other. And the way that they were able to figure this out is by going and looking at Starbucks. Now, is anyone here familiar with Starbucks? <laughs> a large coffee company that you're, uh, that you're holding a cup from right now. <laughs> Look at it. Has anyone here worked at Starbucks? Any, any former baristas? Okay, we got one back there. Um, how, th let me ask you this. What does Starbucks sell? Experience. Experience, of course, you guys are too. Usually if someone says like, if some, everyone says coffee, one person usually says, oh, I buy my drugs there. But the rest of you, <laughs> <laughs> but this card, you guys know, they sell an experience, right? They sell customer satisfaction. In fact, if you talk to Howard Schultz, the CEO or former CEO of Starbucks, he'll tell you the number one thing they sell is customer satisfaction is this experience because that's, that way they can charge $4.50 for a latte that costs them 13 cents to make. Now, the way that they sell that customer experience, as all of you know, is that when you walk into a Starbucks, there's this like soft music playing and there's like wood paneling and, and there's some barista who's young and cute and they ask your name and they write it in big cursive letters on your cup, right? They have this down pat. Now the issue though for Starbucks is that the average Starbucks employee is 19 years old. Was anyone in this room ever 19 years old? <laughs> Let me ask you, did you make the best choices of your life when you were 19 years old? No, I made like the worst choices of my life when I was 19 years old. And it turns out that the problem for Starbucks is that sometimes 19 year olds, they act like 19 year olds. And this can be disastrous, in fact, in an age of social media, let me show you how bad it can get. She was a loyal customer of Starbucks, loved the coffee, loved the service, but that changed a few weeks ago. This native New Yorker got steamed, not by what was inside her cup, but something written on the outside. That's what she called Nina Pineda and ordered a special brew of fully caffeinated seven on your side. And then when you looked at it, what'd you think? I was shocked. I didn't, I didn't understand why. Why would they do that? Vicky Reveron is talking about this Starbucks cup. On the side, a Starbucks employee wrote what she ordered, a caramel frappuccino. But instead of scrawling her name on the side, she says he wrote the B word. It says Vicky. My name is not Vicky, it's Vicky. Now, if you've ever idly wondered, what does $200 million in national advertising sound like going up in flames all at once? <laughs> now you know. <laughs> this was a disaster for Starbucks. This went online as soon as it appeared on TV, and within 24 hours, a million people had seen it. Within the next 48 hours, 10 million people had seen it. Starbucks actually launched an investigation. They found that the next, in the next month, more people saw this clip on YouTube than had seen a Starbucks advertisement. And for a company that's trying to sell customer satisfaction, this is a nightmare, right? This is exactly what you don't want. So Howard Schultz, he launches an investigation. They go in and they try and figure out what happened with Vicky. And they learned that the kid who had helped Vicky is this 19-year-old barista. He's been working at Starbucks for nine months. He has never had a problem in the past. Great kid. He gets into a fight with his mom the night before Vicky comes in. He sleeps like an hour and a half that night. He's an hour seven and a half of an eight-hour shift. And then Vicky comes in. And I think we can all agree what he did is totally unacceptable, right? It is completely, completely unforgivable. He also has the bad luck of handing the cup to Vicky, who looks at it and says, this is totally unacceptable. It is unforgivable. 
you are going to be sorry for this. She goes out, she calls a TV station. The TV station is like, we love this story, but we have all this other stuff. We can't be there for like four or five hours. Vicky's like, that's totally fine. I'll wait for you. She goes home. <laughs> she puts on her nicest blue blouse. She comes back to the Starbucks. She drinks the entire cup of coffee. <laughs> The real lesson here is like, do not mess with Vicky. Like, don't, do not pull this, but most importantly, don't pull it for Vicky. But Starbucks, for Starbucks, what they find is that this is just part of a pattern, right? This is happening again and again and again. They have all these great baristas, 19 year olds. They do a great job and then suddenly one day, they just totally face plant. They do something completely rude and unacceptable like this. They, they get drawn into workplace drama and it's the same pattern over and over again. There's something that happens before a customer comes in. So they break up with their girlfriend or they're fighting with their mom or there's some type of drama going on with the manager. They just become emotionally exhausted and then they do something stupid and totally inappropriate. And so Howard Schultz and his team, they say, look, what we really need to do is we need to teach these kids better willpower, right? We need to teach them how to make it through a shift without falling apart. And so they start looking at all the willpower researchers. And I know that you guys, a number of you know about this research, right? The most famous example of this is the marshmallow experiment, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, where this researcher, Walter Michelle, he takes his daughter who's four years old. This is the 1960s at Stanford. He takes her and a bunch of her classmates, puts them in a, in a room one by one, puts a marshmallow in front of them and says, I'm gonna leave the room. If when I come back, if that marshmallow is still there, then I will give you a second marshmallow. Now. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. I know that some of the Vital Storms training involves the, the marshmallow experiment. It's always fun to watch though. <laughs> Let me show you what happens when you put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. Oh, you're gonna Wait. Okay. So only one of those kids went the whole 10 minutes. Let me show you which one. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay. Now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> That's exactly what my kid would do. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't wait the 10 minutes. So anyways, Walter Michelle, he writes up his results. He finds that about 40% of these kids could resist the marshmallow, publishes his study, nobody pays any attention. So he goes on to work on other stuff. And then a couple of years later, he's talking to his daughter, who's one of the subjects. And he's like, she's in fourth grade now, and he's like trying to make conversation with her, right? How many of you guys have kids? So he was, yeah, so you've been through this. Like, what'd you do today? Nothing. Did you, what did you learn? Nothing. Why am I paying for private school? I don't know. Right? <laughs> and, and he finally gets her talking and she starts saying like, well, you know, Jimmy does well in school, but Susie keeps on getting into trouble. And, and as he's listening, he realizes the kids she says are doing well in school, they were the same kids that had resisted the marshmallow when he tested them four years ago. So he tracks them all down. He tracks them down in high school and in middle school and in college, and he finds that at every single stage, kids who can resist marshmallows do better than everyone else. They get to school on time more frequently. They get their homework done. They're more popular in high school, not because they're like prettier or better at sports. They're just better at being friends. They get into, into better colleges. They get higher paying jobs. They get married earlier and stay married longer. You guys know all of this. Willpower is the single greatest correlate with future success. But the most important thing is he learns you can teach willpower. You can teach kids how to resist the marshmallow. And the way you do it is you make it into a habit for them. So, he t so Walt Howard Schultz at Starbucks, they hire Michelle and a whole bunch of other people and they learn this and they say, this is what we wanna do. We wanna teach willpower habits. We're gonna rewrite all of our training manuals. 
So now when you go to Starbucks, on your first day of work, you learn what's called the latte habit. This is one of dozens that you'll learn throughout your time at Starbucks. Your manager sits you down and they say, look, if an angry customer comes in, that's your cue. What you should do is you should latte them, which means you should listen to their complaint. You should acknowledge their complaint. You should thank them for complaining. You should take care of their complaint by giving them like a free cup of coffee or anything else you want to do. And, and then you should explain why this will never happen again. And the reward is that you had this like adult screaming at you a second ago because you screwed up their espresso. And now they think you're the greatest person on the face of the planet because you just spent three minutes listening to their problem. They rolled this out and employee sat and customer satisfaction scores go through the roof. But weirdly, employee satisfaction scores go through the roof too. And so they start asking employees, why are you using latte? What do you like about it? And they hear people say things like, oh man, I love latte. I latteed my mom last night. It totally worked. <laughs> I latteed my boyfriend. And what they realized is, when you're 19 years old, there is nothing scarier in this entire world than a grown-up yelling at you. Your instinct is to run away or to fight back or to write some rude word on their cup or to do something stupid. And here Starbucks is telling you what to do, making it automatic, teaching you to recognize your own cues and rewards in a way that empowers you. This is what we know, is that the most powerful rewards contain emotions. That when I teach you as a 19 year old how to feel like you are in control of a situation, you will do that thing again and again and again because it just feels so good. And the reason why I love this story so much is that when I was reporting it, I met this kid named Travis. Travis is now in his early 20s. The first time Travis saw his dad overdose on heroin, he was nine years old. At the time, his mom was in prison on a prostitution charge. And Travis is kind of just lost, right? He ends up dropping out of high school. He moves from Lodi, California, which is like a terrible place, to Fresno, which is a slightly less terrible place. And he gets a job. Is anyone here from Fresno? Sorry. Uh, he gets a job at a McDonald's. And he lasts 37 minutes at a McDonald's because on his first shift, he's serving customers and he feels like this one customer is being rude at him because she's staring at him kind of hard. So he reaches into her bag and takes out her chicken and McNuggets and starts throwing them at her because he's, he's freaked out and he gets fired. If you were looking for a recipe for roadkill in life, this is it, right? Parents are drug addicts, mom's a prostitute, can't hold down a job at a fast food restaurant. This is essentially the road to homelessness. And then Travis, almost by chance, he gets hired at Starbucks. And they teach him the latte habit and dozens of other habits. They teach him how to understand himself. And that was like four years ago. And today, he oversees two locations. He has 40 employees. He oversees about $2 million a year in revenue. He just signed the first mortgage to buy a house. It, this is a success story. I, I, I mean, right? Like, this is what we want to support in life. And the reason I'm so excited about telling you guys about this, the reason I'm so excited about partnering with Vital Smarts, and I'm so honored that you will, might take some of these learnings and bring them into the world, is because every company has the ability to help people like Travis. We know why people behave the way they do now in a way that we never have before. We know how to train people to understand their own cues and rewards. We know how to help you and your kids and the people you work with become the people we want to be. The real reason I got interested in habits is because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't make myself exercise and why I ate so much. I feel like I'm a smart guy and it would drive me crazy. It made me feel terrible about myself. But now I know, right now, it, all it takes is someone explaining to you, there's these cues and these rewards, let me help you understand how to identify them. Let me help you have a habit mindset so that you can tap into those automatic parts of your life that otherwise seem out of reach. I hope that all of you get a chance to take some of this, and I'm so thankful and honored that you might, to bring into the world and to help find other Travises and to give them the lives they deserve. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great conference. I look forward to meeting you in the hall.